Now I would like to welcome your panelists on the stage and they're going to talk about capacity and data traffic. Updating the needs and applying the changes and role of satellite and data tsunami. And your panelists on stage, Group Chief Carrier and Wholesale Officer for Atisalat, Mr. Ali Amiri. Senior Vice President International Wholesale EITC, Mr. Khalid Tabara. Head of the Middle East and Africa Region, PCCW Global, Mr. Sami Sabhi. Managing Partner, Telecom Review North America, Mr. Jeff Seal. And Chief Executive Officer, AP Telecom, Mr. Eric Kanda. And your moderator for this, Regional Communications Manager for RIPE NCC, Dr. Shafiq Shaya. And to formally open up this panel discussion, please welcome Mr. Ali Amiri for a keynote speech. So, uh, I was told to have a brief presentation just on the subject. So I thought maybe it's good to share some experience. This is uh, not a PowerPoint experience only. This is a real experience. So I, saw, I thought maybe interesting to some of you, for some of you at least. Okay. If you see this graph, and you see, of course, number of cables from old days, 1998, where you have the capacity is almost on the grass level. But that grass level is suddenly expon exponentially going up. And that's the real magic and the industry had to really plan for it to reach there. Anyone getting, or there was, if there had been a little bit delay from one side or the other, somebody would have been responsible for the bottleneck. Just to make it uh, easy, I have taken for you uh, just a sample, which is up to 2011. And if you can see, see me before, uh, was in service around 2004 end. Now, let, let me just tell you one thing. Prior to that, we in Etisalat had cables which was in 10 giga or 5 giga, something like that. Now, we were also responsible to plan for something which is terabit and investment in multi-million dollars areas of 75 million dollars 70 million dollars those days so now we had a real uh, problem how to convince someone whom you are telling him that at the end of 2005 you are only having 31 steam one <laughs> by the way 10 giga is 64 steam one so 31 is half of 10 giga and now you are planning a cable which is in terabit. Who, if you are the C4, you are even the CTO, how can you agree to that? So this is the difficulty we had. And I let, let me tell you one thing, and I will be very, very open and frank. In the whole of its art manager, there were only three guys who was pro and pushing hard. Not because I want to tell myself, but I was one of them who were in the front, pushing. And the pres president or CEO at that time, Mr. Ali Salam, who was actually, because of this diverse thinking, made the people in a very bad shape. How can they do this? So that is how it was difficult for him to decide. So he had to take me for the first time to the board because he said, I know how important is this. If you don't come with me and they say no, it will be no. And no, what is the consequences of no? He was a very visionary person. I have to appreciate him. And that's what happened. And I went to the board and it clicked and things went fine. In five minutes, the board was quite, I could tell them, progressive board, good board. And that's how it started. Now, when somebody will say that if we had stopped there. We, we had not done it. And for that cable, I will tell you that the first email went out, say, my office, to east, to west, 
And that's how we created, you know. This is a story which is a reality. So, I think here now, one would say that after two years, if you don't, actually that cable would have not meant anything if you had put that much money for nothing. But at the end of the day, if we had not gone for it, we would have been in a very bad shape. This is why it was a timely completion of this terabit cable, which actually matched with the adoption of all this high-speed internet, smartphones, and mobile application, etc. As I said, devices and applications, and if you could see that, 3G launch started, and its salat was uh, 2003. And then we came to 4G and FDDH around 2011. So this is how that previous graph actually told the story. But the important thing is that that exponential curve started with that plan. And, and realistically speaking, in planning a submarine cable, you need to mobilize two years in order for supply agreement to start. Or if you are too quick, maybe one year. But normally it takes, most of the cables we have seen, it takes some of them ages. But very good ones could take one and a half year, one year, two years, very common. Because you go from uh, forming the consortium and then uh, the right partners and then somebody would withdraw and then you don't have the right investment, all the money. And you're talking about 500, 600, 700 million dollars. I mean, this is the consortium size. So this is how I think uh, that was a successful story here that I don't know whether it was luck or somebody was seeing as well the future, this is how it looks. And now, I, as you could see the picture, by the way, this is now the global average speed. When you talk of fixed broadband, 39 megabit, mobile, 9 megabit, 2017. But this picture is not in its salat, of course. In the salat today, we have mobile of 55 megabit and fixed of 35. And of course, uh, this is uh, by 2020, uh, 22, which is, uh, we are going to go much beyond. If today we are 55, 2022 average for the world is uh, 75 for uh, the fixed, and mobile is only 29. So this is just the picture which is uh, as per the Cisco thing. Now you can see that also in terms of uh, global IP and uh, traffic percentage by application, and you could see that what's with you comprises of 75%, gaming 1%, 17% as per the Cisco. And the one thing is that smartphones will generate 55% of the global IP traffic in 2022, which is 23% in 2017. This is the worldwide average. This is, in fact, in terms of what is today's customers, customer requirements and market players that that changing the working model. You could see uh, today or before or now, you can see that before it was mostly consortium of telcos. And also uh, the, the, the cables, uh, what was uh, happening in fact that uh, cable cuts and all this was impacting uh, the customers and all. Today, the picture is totally different. Now, today, you can see that uh, uh, consortium is of uh, uh, telcos and uh, 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 the sort of uh, delivery developments. Uh, by the way, I, I, because I'm going for that, it's not very clear over here. Huh? <laughs> Maybe I have to stand here to read what I have written. This is I mean, something that we have written. Yeah, so what we are saying is that before, the cable cuts was occasionally and it was impacting customers. Content was often resides overseas. Today, the picture is different, which is consortia and telcos and content delivery networks are part of the game. 
cable cuts impacting customers are not acceptable and content is brought closer to the customer. Like, for example, today in UAE, we have more than 65% of our content in, in the country, I mean. So that's a picture, you know. Because otherwise, for all these contents, you have to go towards east, towards west, mostly towards west. So this is the picture. And what we are saying is that CDN is to carry the majority of the internet, internet traffic by 2020. In fact, it is expected more than 70%. So, maybe this is the last slide. What is it in terms of customers' expectation? How to meet this uh, and a sort of proactive approach from telcos that we need? You really, you're having multi terabit in terms of capacities now, and you are adding one, two, three, four, five cables. No matter, no matter how many cables you have, if one-sixth of your customers are out, you are impacted. So you have to really plan in, in both. How you trim your usage during failure and priorities that you create for at least not impacting the major services. So that's quite important. Now, if someone tells me, this is what I've written here, that you have to have uh, strategic moves in making right investments, choosing the right partners with the objective, objective of meeting business and customer cars in terms of speed, latency, and capacity. Today, latency is, of course, of prime importance. And most cables are differ differentiated one to other because of the latency and better uh, reliability, of course. So this is just, I think, was the last slide. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it gives me a pleasure to be with you here today. We have uh, a group of esteemed speakers with us. I know it's not uh, an easy task for us for this last session, but we'll make it a little bit uh, nicer and quicker. And quicker. Uh, Mr. Ali, uh, presentation was a good introduction for our topic today. He talked about capacity, increasing demand for uh, bandwidth. He talked about the new technology, 4G, 5G, submarine cable. And one of the topics that we had this afternoon was the 5G. And this put a lot of pressure on the mobile operators and services and suppliers to deliver a big capacity and the performance. So today we'll have the perspective of our esteemed uh, panelists to see how they are dealing with these challenges from mobile operator perspective and from a service provider perspective. So my question, Mr. Ali, for you, how you are dealing with the challenges regarding the capacity and the performance of your networks? Well, I, just, I just mentioned something that no matter how many cables you add, today you have to be careful. There are service, services that are quite sensitive to latency. So right from the beginning, we had to, in terms of availability of networks, we have an internal planning that at any point of time, if how many cables goes faulty, you are still okay. I mean, this is, goes without saying, because you, don't, you can't panic during the actual failure. So, and then it goes between network quality, latency, and you have to understand, at the end of the day, towards the backhauling, some changes that you make for any rearrangement, most of it now we have planned it automatically. In the beginning, it was not automatically. But those which are automatic also, you pay for it. Because everything, there's a pay, there's a price for everything. How much you have to go out? Now, thanks to localization of the content, that has helped us a lot. And that not only has helped us, has, has helped also the region, those who are connected to us, to the smart hub that we have in, in the region. So those who have connectivity to all, whether uh, the telcos or whether the CDNs that we have, the major CDNs that we have in the smart hub, that helps people 
and ourselves for that uh, in, in terms of eventuality of the cable failures. But as I said, these plans, because the capacity, you saw that exponential thing. So the, the strategic is, the, is so day-to-day uh, -day almost. Your strategy has to be changed accordingly. Your planning, where to invest, what to invest, when to invest, type of cable, whatever, is quite this. I mean, partly it's just like maybe Dubai in terms of RDA and it, its uh, highways and whatever. Our, our work is also traffic. That's traffic, this is traffic. But maybe uh, in our traffic, you will uh, wake up one day uh, and then you have launched a service that you can go eat as much as you can and do whatever you want uh, from consumer side, from enterprise side. I mean, at the end of the day, you as responsible for the infrastructure, for those cables, for those investments, should not create any bottleneck. Thank you. Uh, I will ask the same question, Mr. Rich, for you, uh, but one added question. Uh, Mr. Ali talked about this connection and this, the, the smart hub and the uh, it's a lot uh, submarine cables. Sure. Do. It's not only about technology. They talk, our colleagues uh, in the afternoon talked about collaboration between, opera um, between operators. So do you have this kind of, uh, of, of collaboration with Etisalat regarding the interconnection between Do and Etisalat and how you deal with the challenges for the capacity and data traffic? Sure, sure. Let, let me just, uh, first of all, thank you to Telecom Review for having me on this esteemed panel. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. And good evening, everyone. And, and Shafiq, if you may, I can, if I just wanted to set the context with the slide that yeah, I had. slide, please. So if I can just, and then I'll answer your questions one by one. There is one slide, please. You cut on the same presentation. <laughs> okay. While, while, they get the, exactly. while they get the slide up, to, to answer your question, uh, definitely there is a collaboration between the two, um, two telecom operators in the UAE. We interconnect and we provide services together. Uh, we also have a, a similar initiative uh, called Data Mina, where we aggregate um, uh, customers in terms of cloud content providers. Uh, we have access to submarine cables um, through through each other uh, that's available and 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 that's something that uh, that's hugely enhanced the the attractiveness of uae as a as a hub to do business uh, here uh, and and for both both parties uh, to to the question on whether how do we handle challenges on our networks i think the key that we have realized is to be intelligent about it to understand where our traffics are going, to have far more uh, understanding of where we want to spread the traffic, use diversity, use our own cable systems. We have invested into two cable systems. We have obviously come much later than Etisalat. So we have invested into two cable systems, which is EIG and CMU5. Uh, we have private cables like GBI and, and uh, GCX with us. So we, we use a combination all of them, of them uh, to meet our capacity demand. We then also try to peer with some of the large networks. So intelligently trying to meet those uh, demands using caching uh, to, to address that. So that's, that's how we have, been, we have been trying to do. Perfect. Slides? There's no slides? I think it's got well, only one slide. <laughs> OK. That's OK. So just if I can. So that, the, the slide that I had was to uh, explain the fact that increasingly our submarine cables are becoming commoditized. Uh, they, they have become a commodity. <coughs> and I was trying to illustrate that um, just like any of the um, uh, rice or pulses or anything else in the market, our telecom services are becoming a commodity. And, and com by commodity, what we mean is anything that can be bought in bulk and doesn't have too much differentiation. The problem with, uh, with becoming a commodity is that people can buy from somebody else easily and, and move on. While it's not a bad thing, I mean, there are people who succeed enormously and have built multi-billion dollar businesses in wholesale of rice or oil or any of those things. But we need to acknowledge the fact that we need to either get good at it or go up the value chain and create value-added services on it. So that's, that's how I, I, we, I was trying to approach the capacity and the data traffic uh, uh, problems that we are going to have. Thank you. My question. Uh we saw that the 
increasing demand for video streaming is really a lot. Yeah. Because we have for 2022, 82% of the traffic will be video streaming. Yeah. So how to balance between the capacity and the network performance? Um, first of all, uh, in PCCW, we have two types of traffic. The, our organic traffic, which serves Hong Kong market, and uh, I would consider it for PCW Global, it's the minority. The majority, since we are more wholesale-oriented company, is the wholesale part, where is our customer needs. Uh, uh, for its a lot and do the, their major investment goes, as I said, for the organic. But uh, in PCCW or in Hong Kong market, uh, back in 2012, we launched one gig uh, fiber to home. And in 2017, we launched 10 gig fiber to home. So you can imagine the, the numerous amount of traffic and bandwidth that needs. So we make sure that wherever there is a new system that lands in, in Hong Kong, we should be part of it. Whether it's built by the OTT, is built of the competition, built by ourselves, or jointly co-built with someone else, uh, we, we make sure that we are part of the system. Uh, 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 the network performance and, and, and how we manage it, I think there are a lot of new technology. I'm not in position uh, uh, to talk about it rather than my colleagues from the mobile operators, but the peering is one of the solutions that all the mobile operators, they are uh, using it, also caching in order to reduce the traffic on their, uh, on their network. So there are a lot of things nowadays available in the market where they can optimize your traffic on the network. I like the peering issue because we are working with Do on the spearing issue. Uh, as RAP and CC, we, we had uh, initiatives wor working with operators to optimize their uh, routing and traffic. And we see that in this region, the routing is really in a bad shape. And it needs to be, you know, to, to be enhanced, yeah. and to be reshaped in another framework. So my question to, to Jeff, Jeff, do you think satellite will be an added value to, to save this uh, capacity network crunch? To, to give us another channel, another technology uh, Well, yeah, windows. the satellite would be an added value, no question. You know, there are a lot of different satellite systems that are out there, and some people are using it for cloud backup. Some people are using it for network backhaul to a degree. But it really depends on how much capacity someone's looking to put up on a satellite. You know, there's uh, uh, the Google people. They have what they call their Project Loon. I know that's not a satellite, but a similar concept is they float these things around the world, and they're providing broadband services to people in countries that have never had it. So that kind of capability is something that's valuable, and it works, and, and it's taken, in my, I may be wrong on my numbers, but I think three to four years to actually get it where it's a commercially viable type product. And they backed up, I think it was all of Bangladesh. Uh, they do a lot in South America, things like that. But new satellites are being launched. There's new LEO satellites that are going up in uh, the North America region, where I am. And I, I see all their television commercials, but they haven't commercially launched for the last year. So if and when that comes up, it's kind of a wait and see type situation there. But you know, satellite, you talk about satellite as a viability. Mobile networks have been used for backing up terrestrial networks. And I'm going to use an example in North America. Verizon has used their mobile network to back up certain of their customers on a <coughs> basis. And it worked, and it worked fine. I've been not had problems. And they are in the process of deploying their 5G network, and that's not right away, I know. But what happens when they're able to, when they deploy those kinds of things, they can do more and more backup capabilities there. So I think there's a lot of options that are out there and available. Uh, we talked about above and beyond satellite. You know, we, one of the things that you started out with was planning on networks. And, and network planning is a key for anybody. You've got a plan, you've got a forecast, things like that. But also, technological innovations are a big key too. You, know, you look at uh, in the submarine industry, you have the C plus L technology to, to boost your distance and your capacities on those submarine cables that are out there. You have people that are doing a lot better job planning. I mean, you look at some of the, uh, the OTT type players, you know, the Googles, Facebooks, and all that. You look at some of the submarine cables, they're part of their consortiums, and I'm going to use the Atlantic side of North America. They're not going to England or UK anymore. They're all going to Spain or France and places like that. So they've got network diversity, number one, but they're able to, to really plan their networks better by going to Southern Europe, picking up African capacity, things like that. 
Um, you look at a, a company like uh, Google, who's, they're, they're planning, they haven't deployed it yet, but they have what they refer to as, I, I believe the name is Durant, and they're going from Virginia to France. That's and they're the, only, they're the only investor in this cable, which I thought was, it, at first I thought, there's a lot of capacity there. But you know, one <coughs> of the reasons why they're doing that is so that they can control not only their capacity and their own destiny, but they can control their latency. And, and that, to me, was a key point that a lot of people didn't pick up on, is they own the whole thing, they control their latency, the whole nine yards. And they're doing a similar system that's going from Chile in South America to the west coast of the U.S. They're the only investor in the system. They're able to control their own destiny. Now, granted, they have the money to do this, and not everybody does, but, but that they control their own destiny in a situation like that. And, and that's just another prime example of capacity planning that's going to take care of you know, all the video and, and all the other data that's just exploding everywhere around the world. I, I morphed a little off satellite, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah. but, but I, I just see a lot more new things that are coming up in the world. Actually, They're really yeah, important. They let me add to Jeff's uh, uh, comments. Also, they are building the uh, South, uh, West Africa cable from South yeah. Africa all the way to London, and they are slowly, yeah. invest, slowly the, investing. The latest in announcement was between Facebook and Amazon. Yeah. They, this is for Maria. Know, they go exactly, yeah. So I will take from the OTTs, submarine cables. We heard a lot about evolution and revolution in the, in the, you know, in the previous sessions. So. I believe that there is an evolution in the technology, but revolution in business. Eric, how are the OTTs uh, increasing their presence in the submarine cable market will affect this market? Uh, it's, it's good and bad. Uh, from an American perspective, I can tell you that in the last nine years, AP Telecom has worked on seven cable projects. We've sold $300 million. We get our 3%. It's nine million bucks for two guys. Um, we've seen OTTs come in and invest 40 million, 80 million, and we've seen systems really struggle. And the reason why is that when the OTTs purchase capacity, they buy at cost plus economics, cost plus three, cost plus five, cost plus seven. Uh, they understand what the per kilometer pricing is in the industry. They know that when you build a new system, you should be between 22 and 25,000 per kilometer. They understand that very well. Um, they know how to buy well. Uh, the OTTs in general are very different. Uh, Google uh, acts very differently than Facebook. Facebook has a user-generated content challenge. Their users upload content that has to be sent almost instantaneously. It's very difficult to cache and put that on the edge <coughs> of the network. So just by a show of hands in the audience, how many people have heard of the technology or the app called Periscope? So Periscope is very popular in the United States, um, and it's threatening mainstream media and particularly sports events because the younger generation, the millennials, now take out their phones because they're always on their phones. I can tell you that as a dad of two children. Uh, they're always on their phone, and now they're, they're televising the, the games live. So ESPN or Sky Sports, they're seeing a challenge that a lot of the millennials like watching Periscope to watch the live, live matches. But that puts tremendous strain on the network, okay? So uh, the, the challenge, I think, is that if you're going to co-invest with an OTT, you have to have a combination of uh, telco buyers that are going to ha help offset the underwriting costs that the OTTs are going to bring. They move the needle, they buy a fiber pair, but they pay cost plus three, cost plus five, cost plus seven. But your cost of capital is 12, 15, 18%. So you have a negative delta right from the beginning, which is very, very challenging. So not all the OTTs invest the same manner, uh, but when they do invest, they invest very aggressively and they expect cost-based economics. And their, uh, their objective is very differ different than a telecom player's objective. Their objective is the lowest price per megabit, where the telecom uh, operator, entrepreneurial or PTT, incumbent telco, wants obviously the highest price per, per megabit because we're selling access. So there is a divergence in terms of objectives. So uh, the example that we give is um, whether we're in London or New York and we're meeting with private equity people to invest in a cable is that just be careful. Uh, 
You may move into a building, brand new building as a tenant. You may think this is a great building, but just remember some of your neighbors are good neighbors. They go to bed at night. They don't play their music loud. They take their garbage out. Some neighbors are not good neighbors. And be careful who you have as your neighbor because long term you have to live with them for 15, 20 years. The submarine cables is really uh, helping and adding its value to the data traffic. One question for Mr. Ali and Mr. Mahesh from Adu. <clears throat> the question is always the last mile. The last mile is the bottleneck. What you are doing to deal with the last mile connection? Well, the last mile connection in UAE, I think we have already done. Because we have in terms of penetration, fiber to the home, we are 98%. If you're talking about last mile to the customer. Exactly. Correct? So that's why I think uh, UAE, we are almost considered the number one maybe in terms of fiber to the home connectivity at the top of uh, many countries. Of course, uh, thanks to the investments which was put um, all over the country almost. And today we are seeing the advantage of that investment, which was in the past, maybe it was not that much this, but today it's really seen when you see that people are so thirsty for bandwidth and usage of those bandwidth. So in UAE, I think, uh, especially in UAE, we don't have, because we are, it's a lot, we are in 16 countries. We have uh, a sort of a customer base of 140 million. So elsewhere, we have challenges and we are working on it to at least uh, uh, meeting the requirements because uh, whether you have uh, a mobile operator so that you have uh, only 3G, uh, you have to go the right path. So many of these works were done because you have to go for 4G, 5G, and that's also part of the last mile thing. The availability of uh, bandwidth, you cannot really do something if you are not part of the 4G today. I mean, it's becoming quite uh, important that uh, you have the right investment matching the people's expectation and technology. So you have the advantage on this. Is there any infrastructure sharing with other operators in this last mile? In, As again, again, in UAE, of course, we have got a uh, couple of, uh, because we have a regulatory regime, which is, uh, we are having a number of uh, cooperations. And uh, we have, for example, what is called uh, public in infrastructure sharing through PIS. Uh, we could uh, do, could use uh, areas where uh, they, uh, they do not have uh, fiber or whatever. And some areas which are due are uh, quite, uh, uh, in terms of penetration, quite high. We may use them also. So that, that, that's part of the PIS. In addition to that, of course, uh, we've got also uh, other cooperations that, in, especially in major projects, where also there is a lot of cooperation. Work. So I, I echo what Mr. Miri was saying. I think uh, we are fortunate that we have a country that's uh, relatively densely concentrated and not very large. Too. So we've pretty much covered the whole country with fiber between the two operators. Uh, we had fiber to the home. 10, 12 years ago, so it's, 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 been, a, it's been well served per se. And, and like Mr. Mary said, there is passive infrastructure sharing. And if there are areas that one of the operators doesn't have, we have the ability to reach that, that, that access. So that challenge is less or so. And as, as some of the uh, panelists were talking earlier today, 5G we hoping will come and, and allow us access into areas that you don't and, and, and leapfrog that kind of uh, challenge. Of we have also the bit stream. Absolutely, we also have bitstream. So, okay, uh, talking about 5G, uh, we heard a lot that 5G is, yes, will come next year, but there are challenges. For example, uh, one of the challenges is the frequency, <coughs> the spectrum allocation. So how you are helping your customers with your... <laughs> we are not in that business, really, as BGW Global, so I might skip this question and maybe uh, Mr. Ali or Mahish can answer about the frequency or someone else. Uh, Jeff, satellite. Well, uh, you're talking about frequencies. Frequency. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean you use the U.S. perspective. I'm sorry. But the uh, there you have a big issue with spectrum and your capabilities of what you have in your network, what you're going to do with it, and how you're going to do it. We continually are are bringing on more spectrum 
that we've reallocated from another area. And, and I'll, I'll use an example, the television stations that broadcast always had a certain amount of spectrum that was granted to them by the Federal Communications Commission. And they reallocated certain portions of that spectrum so they could sell it in a bandwidth auction to all the mobile carriers so that they can have more spectrum, more capabilities as the 5G network rolls out coming up in the next couple of years. Well, that, that's good, but when you start talking about <coughs> A, you roll out of small cells. B, your capability to utilize all of that spectrum. I mean, the bulk of that spectrum was in what we refer to as NFL cities, you know, the larger cities there. And, and to be able to utilize that spectrum, you're going to have to have all your small cells deployed. And in a larger city, those are, are typically not something where you can have a unilateral decision and say, okay, yeah, you can put them wherever you want. You have all sorts of different cities that are going to say, no, I want a special fee, I want to do this, and it's very hard to get all those deployed <coughs> without some sort of, of, of rules that make it reasonably easy to do. And where you don't have everybody, all these city governments with their hand out, wanting extra fees to pay for their grandma's new house or whatever it may be. So one of the things that in the states that we've done is, and this has happened the last month, the Federal Communications Commission, which monitors everything that goes on there, recently came up with a new order that stated that these cities can no longer hold up all these, these uh, small cell deployments. They can to a degree, but they can no longer hold it up with exorbitant fees, uh, you know, long periods of time for approval, things like that. They have to get them approved, and, and don't quote me on this time, but I believe it was 30 days on the applications. And they have to do it for a maximum fee of something that's fairly reasonable on these small cells. And that is going to help all the, you know, the larger mobile carriers that have their own network, that's going to help them deploy that network, the, the 5G network with the small cells. So once they're, they're doing something like this, I mean, they get it deployed, you are taking care of a big, big issue there. They've now gone through all those spectrum auctions. They, they you hope, or they hope, that that they have enough of that new spectrum to handle it, although we all know that you know it's a never-ending quest to need more spectrum and more and more and more. So you know, deploying, making your your small cell deployment even more dense is going to help, and, and you're always going to look for ways to really groom that network more and more and more. But at a certain point, you know, the spectrum's not unlimited. Exactly. So what are they going to do on that? You know, that's kind of something we're going to on a wait and see situation. For the submarine cables, what are the drivers that they are driving this market today? Uh, the, the math is very clear, the mathematics. Uh, if you go to Stanford or you're at uh, Wheeler at MIT, they'll tell you that historically in the past, for every 100,000 subscribers that you had for a 3G or 4G network, that would equate to about 30 gig of capacity international that you would require. The challenge with five gig mathematically from a quantitative perspective is that it's the first network that's being deployed that's not intended for human beings only, right? Because of the machine nature. So how does the math change? So you may have the same number of citizens, 100,000 that you're gonna have to reserve say 30 gig, but how many additional devices are you going to have and what that does, does that equate to in terms of the mathematics? So um, we're hearing numbers that, it, and they don't know. Some of it's art, some of it's science. They're going to have to see how things go in the next few years. <coughs> but that, that's the main driver, is that you're going to continue to see more people become online, whether it's in the US, or whether it's in Asia, or South Africa, Middle East, you name it. But that, that's going to be the question mark. So there is no rule of thumb with the number of devices and what that's going to equate to in terms of capacity, domestic and international. But in the past, it was for every 100,000 equated to a 30 gig. Uh, Sameh, oh. the driver behind the overcapacity differs, but the result is the same, cost and complex upgrade. So right. from PCW Global, how you look at this? How you but, deal with this? Um, first of all, um, I think uh, all, of, uh, all of you have heard about our new project, which is called Peace, which is uh, Pakistan, uh, East Africa, and Europe. Uh, actually, we, we adopt the same model. Uh, we looked into different angles. What are the challenges? Uh, 
uh, we heard uh, during the morning panels about the 5G, the security, and all of them, they have the same message, uh, uh, the cost, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, flexibility for the upgrades, and, uh, and uh, uh, the decision-making time. <coughs> Uh, so uh, we look into all those uh, uh, points and we came up with a model which is like a fiber pair assets. So what we are doing is we are selling fiber pair to our end customers, which will give the operators, will give the OTTs, will give the ISPs the flexibility in order to control their, their, their upgrade according to their needs. And basically they will uh, inject the, the, the CAPEX or OPEX according to their needs. Uh, uh, this was our, uh, one of our new initiatives that we are driving nowadays in the market. Is there a way to reduce the capacity without uh, decreasing the performance of the network? Is there any mean to do this? Reducing the capacity. That means to, to have the same performance of the network, but to manage yeah. the capacity in more uh, actually, you need more pipes, you need more bandwidth with all the, uh, the, uh, the virtual uh, reality, with the say, machine to machine. I don't think that the, the traditional ways were caching it, peering more, yeah, having yeah. localized peering, uh, making it as close as possible to the customer. So those are the traditional means of how you would reduce the utilization yeah. of the next I I think, I think you, you have to analyze the market that you have different players. There are people who have a lot of organic traffic and they may have more capacity on one link, but then availability of the submarine cable is important, as I said, because if you are talking about 1.52 tera and you distribute these 1.52 tera over four cable is not enough five, six, in reality, it may still not be enough because the big challenge, correct? Because you are, so what happens now when people add cables and new cables, you may go for, thanks to the technology, we went from a lambda of 10 giga lambda to 40 giga lambda, from 40 giga lambda to 100 giga lambda. So now that creates extra capacity for sure. But then what happens? Those extra capacity goes to the hands of people who are doing business, carriers. And some people are actually having no organic capacity requirements whatsoever. So I have invested and 50, 60 million dollars, and I'm sitting in this capacity, what do I do with it? <laughs> so I have to dump it. Exactly. One way or another, okay? And this is the name of the game. So thanks to the technology, mm -hmm. and then people are trying to be on the market, try to the players. Sometimes they play it right, sometimes things go wrong. That's the problem. Part of that, if I can answer yeah. to, to continue to what Mr. Amiri was saying, mm -hmm. is that most of the submarine cables have a minimum ticket size. So they say there's a minimum investment unit. So when you get into that minimum investment unit, it leaves you with a lot more capacity generally than, than you would need. So sometimes there is an inequality in the size of the, the players in the same cable. So but again, offer and demand. if I just add also, I think uh, he was rightly mentioning the way OTT is coming along. Yeah. See, this is another important yeah. thing. This is a challenge. This is a big challenge. Now, OTTs are normally, the submarine cables have been three pair, four pair, five pair, three pair fibers. Now, we are talking in terms of 12. 16 pair fiber, 24 pair, 24 pair fiber submarine cables. All right, now, and you mentioned one very good thing in terms of cost plus, right? So they look at it, and sometimes, some of them, I think, they've got experts on board to do whatever, yeah. do, you know, they, so, Things are, are different, and as he rightly said, you will have different neighbors. <laughs> so, but you have to coexist and learn from each other Ecosystem. what best you could do. That's yeah. what I said. You have to be strategic on what you are doing. That's why the, the, the increasing demand for Internet of Things, for virtual reality, for, for these uh, clouding yeah. services, yeah. 
yeah. I believe that all this capacity will be used. Nothing will be wasted, and your investment is in the right place. But we need the right timing and the right services for this. Exactly. So, just I want to open the the the, the question the, the for the floor, please. Any question from the floor for our esteemed uh, panelists, please, please. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Mohammed Mahaloub, uh, BCW Global. I just wanted to ask our panel about what their view is in the wholesale and capacity uh, market for orchestration. You know I mean, I imagine that in a few years' time, uh, we'll find that the network engineers sitting in the observing the core is network will be on uh, all orchestrated, and they can have a real-time. Uh, live view of how the network is performing and how the bandwidth on the core is uh, efficiently utilized. How do you see that as an opportunity rather than a threat and more importantly as um, a way to encourage more collaboration between different carriers in terms for example swap deals and making them more efficient and less cumbersome in terms of paperwork and legal can I answer yes, this? Yes. Actually, very good question. And I, I think the, the, the key part is that we should understand that our submarine cables have not kept, the, the, the model is still a traditional model mm -hmm. compared to where the computing has changed. So today the computing or the, com the industry has changed. You can buy servers by the minute, by the hour, uh, et cetera. Whereas the submarine cable still is a, in a, is a one year contract with fixed bandwidths, et cetera. So to your point that whether how would it change with orchestration? I think it is, there would be a move towards that and it should happen. I think uh, we need to move our industry to a point where you can buy submarine cable capacity without long-term contracts, uh, being able to flex it, optimize it, uh, increase it when you want it, decreases when you, but that's not, we're not there yet. And I think that's, that's, cool. that's a step that will happen. It'll get triggered by events. Uh, right now, we like the predictability of uh, a one-year contract, uh, but <coughs> the models will change. Somebody will disrupt this with a with a model where you can buy and sell on a on a on demand. On demand, absolutely. A yeah. uh, lot of discussions uh, were on the IE, artificial intelligence, on managing the networks. Yes. So maybe we will see in the next uh, years networks are managing themselves. Yeah. Maybe it's an idea for a startup. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, today to start with this band, bandwidth and demand, I mean, this is something that uh, actually is already on and, st and, and, and it's also in some cases maybe extended to some customers, not all, to be able to trace their bandwidth, what they want, how much to increase, how much Dynamic to allocation. Dynamic yeah. allocation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Please. Can we have the micro? Um, Hamad from Itzalat. Um, my question would be for Mr. Jeff. Um, regarding uh, 5G, and especially for ultra low uh, latency applications, uh, <clears throat> we can see that the last mile is below uh, the one millisecond. And for that, uh, <clears throat> we are expecting the same from the submarine cables because uh, when we look to the latency, we should be looking it to end to end. So for example, for surgery, which we are expecting to come with the 5G, and if the doctor is found in Germany, and he's doing remotely the surgery here to someone in Dubai, the total uh, latency of the, uh, of the whole network in such case would be a challenge. So how, how we are looking to the investment in, um, in the submarine cables from technology perspective that it would be meeting the same time of uh, going with the other applications and uh, wouldn't this be a challenge to come on time especially at uh, uh, 
at this low, uh, low latency that we are seeing with the 5G. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I think your question is an excellent <coughs> question. Um, T, T Systems in uh, Honolulu in Hawaii uh, had a Segway, which is a, a device that you stand on that helps you move. If anyone's seen the movie uh, Mall Cop, it's what a lot of people use, uh, Paul Blart. Um, and they had latency at 35 milliseconds. They tested this on the beaches in Waikiki uh, at the conference this year in January. And at 35 milliseconds, there was no one on it, but the latency was very good that the Segway device, almost like a bicycle, could electronically move by itself. At 50 milliseconds, it started to get wobbly. At 75, it fell over and the person would have been hurt, using the example of an autonomous car. So the, the, the sentiment and the feeling is that <coughs> Latency from a metro perspective is very, very important, whether it's a combination of fiber, wireless, or hybrid, a mixture of those fiber and wireless. Latency from a subsea perspective uh, is very different. Uh, normally, high frequency trading network firms that trade FX, equities, bonds, what have you, they'll take a very large pipe, but they only use a very small portion of it. They'll take down the actual um, uh, the, the ability for amplification, what's called FEC, fair forward error correction. They'll turn off FEC because they'll expect degradation of latency of throughput, but they'll pick up speed. So speed is the name of the game. Getting back to what was said is that the, the, the way the, the latency works across the Atlantic on the nylon, the New York London route right now, or LA <coughs> Tokyo is very simple. You have a primary path, which is number one, you have a secondary path, which is number two, a third, a fourth, a fifth. And the algorithm will run normally a mesh framework, a mesh topology predicated on a 40, 30, 20, 10. So 40% will run on your primary path. So using the number of 1.5 terabits, 40% of 1.5 terabits is 600 gig. 600 gig would say run on Hibernia because it's the lowest path between New York and London, if you need that. But latency is not important to everyone. And I, I guess the last kind of uh, analogy that I would give or example uh, is that we're at a horse racing place right now. Some cables are a thoroughbred, a beautiful horse that are for show, that are very few times are used. But some horses are work horses that take out the, the, uh, the hay, okay, and do the heavy lifting. There are some cables that are work cables, that are work horse cables that are designed to tr carry a lot of IP transit traffic, pipe and port, those cables are not commanding a premium in the market. The thoroughbred, the low latency cables are. Those are the price horses, the show horses, okay? The, the, the horses that you would see in movies like Lawrence of Arabia, stuff like that. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. I'm happy to talk after, but it was a good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much. So we, we saw that. Oh, sorry, one, one last question. OK. Thank sorry, you. I can't see the light. Yeah. Right here, yeah. So right. I have a question regarding we have three media now that we kind of use for communications. We've got uh, fiber, cellular, and satellite. Uh, do you see a day where cellular to, uh, could replace, could fix, or could replace fiber, at least fiber to the home? And do you see a day that satellite would replace cellular or are we seeing all three continue to, co to coexist for the near future for foreseeable future okay uh, you repeat the question okay I the <laughs> there are three medias that means the satellite the fixed and the mobile and you you will see one day that one of these medias will come over the other one or they will continue and Ecosystem satellite, satellite, landline, fixed, landline, and Fiber. mobile. Okay. In, so, in, in terms of what capacity or what? In terms of in terms of what? Sorry. Transport. The media, so the bandwidth. Transport. <laughs> in terms of bandwidth. <laughs> okay, man. okay. Thank you. In terms of bandwidth. Well, I think uh, the comparison whether we are comparing uh, satellite with mobile. Maybe satellite with cables in terms of capacity? Yeah, Today, I think there is no comparison between satellite and cables in terms of capacity. But having said that, satellite is playing a big role in terms of video and coverage and 
point to multi point or whatever uh, services which is available today. And majority of uh, satellites today, maybe 60 or some of them maybe 50, some of them 80, still on video. But if you ask major operators to what extent the satellite is used compared to the capacities used on cables, it's very tiny. So uh, this is the comparison. But in terms of, I think, mobile, it's, it's separate. Mobile is the generator of capacity, which those capacities have to be then carried through, through either fiber or satellite. Oh. Now, again, satellite in some areas, which is uh, maybe there's almost no uh, connectivity in terms of cable, then has to be uh, satellite. But otherwise, but otherwise, it may tend up to be very expensive. Thank you, Sari. I believe that they complement each other in all uh, the areas. So thank you so much because the organizers, mm. we exceed our times. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you for you. being with us. Thank okay. you.